about the prospect for the US economy, the global economy. And then we're going to go to what does it mean for markets? And what does it mean in particular for the three things that people really care about in this room? Your expected returns, volatility, and correlations. And the hope is that we're going to leave you with a sense of the neighborhood, the context in which you're going to be operating over the next 12, 24 months, and perhaps beyond. If we don't do that, we're going to leave time for questions so you can make sure that we do do that. So let me start with something for today, the Fed. At 2 o'clock, the Fed is going to issue a statement, and then we're going to have a press conference. Stephanie, over the last 24 to 48 hours, we've had conflicting data. We had a big miss on confidence that suggests that maybe the household sector is not doing as well as it is. But then we had very strong ADB labor markets today, which showed that once again, economists consistently underestimate job creation in the US. So in that room, how do you think the Fed officials balance these competing high frequency signals about the economy? Well, it's a good question. I think that, um, you know, if the Fed is data dependent, as they continue to insist that they are, there's some chance that they may look at the consumer confidence numbers and say, well, this is something of a reflection of maybe the shutdown, um, temporary, right, and that they discount or uh, underweight the importance of that relative to um, what they perceive to be stronger and stronger conditions in the labor market. But look, I mean, I look and I say this labor market continues to pull people from out of the labor force. Every time we get a report, we see increasing strength of this ability of people who weren't seeking officially uh, taking jobs. And so I'd like to think that the Fed is um, aware of that and thinking carefully about the implications of allowing uh, a delay in a, another rate hike on those grounds. So your expectations for this year in terms of rate hikes? Yeah, I think, I still think that absent some event, probably three is the right number. Um, it's what I, uh, is that? Is so that three, three versus the market saying zero. Chris, um, conventional wisdom is that the Fed miscommunicated, yes. realized, and did a 180, and the Fed put is back. And in particular, the Fed will never go anywhere near saying again that balance sheet reduction is on autopilot. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't know if they won't say that, but a couple of things about the Fed. Obviously, they, we think they made a major mistake in December. They've had issues with communication over the last few months whether it's where the neutral rate is or the balance sheet. One of the issues that we talk about is there was a very big reversal without a significant amount of data. What, what we saw, what came to the equity markets is in the early part of this year, the message was, hey, we listened to these capital market players. You guys are smart. You guys have information. We're, we're going to listen to you now. Before, it was almost tone deaf, and, that, and that's a positive. But the thing that we worry about is today the Fed will speak. They have less information than they typically would. We had a very dovish Fed at the beginning of the month. It's hard for, for us to see that in the short term they can be as dovish, that the, the market expectations will, won't be disappointed at this point in time. We do expect some sort of disappointment. And, and the thing that we fear about is at this point we think less is now more. The presser, they, they box, this, box themselves into a presser, but I think what you've seen as they've talked and talked and talked, they, they've created more uncertainty and, and more issues. So one of the things that we worry about today is just it's really hard not to let down the markets in the short term. So David, our two colleagues say it's really hard not to let down the market in the short term. Chris by saying the message won't be as dovish. Stephanie by saying they still stick to three hikes. Yes. Where are you on this? Uh, quite a bit different, actually. Um, 
I think the, the odds on favorite is there's no hikes at all this year. There's no cuts either. I would also say that I think that the odds of a cut and an ending of QT are higher than the odds of a hike. I think we're on pause. I think, as you pointed out, Mohammed, there was a huge set of miscommunications beginning back on October 3rd with the PBS interview with Judy Woodruff and the long way from neutral. The market got taken very much by surprise. I think Jay Powell's ability to kind of take that back was, was delayed for some reason. We don't know why. And it created a lot more anxiety. What happened in December at the press conference as well was uh, a, a sort of flip and a flop and a flip and a flop. I, I think now we're, we're at a place where probably off-the-cuff statements from Jay will be discounted uh, because they seem to be um, not particularly useful communications. And maybe we'll be listening for folks like John Williams and Rich Clarida, one of your old colleagues, who I think did an excellent job of calming the market at a time of great stress in Q4. I'll add that I, I think my main difference uh, with the other panelists, and I don't know that it's that big, is that we have a lot of tightening in the pipeline, Mohammed. We have 250 basis points of rate hikes. We have 500 billion of balance sheet reduction, and we're set for 600 billion more balance sheet reduction. We don't know what QT does. We know QE fixes things. We probably know QT breaks things. That's about all we know. And what, what I think, how I think about this is I say 250 plus 50, maybe 75 for QT, maybe more. We're at 300, 350 basis points. Historically, that's been enough to really cause damage to markets. In 94, for example, we hiked 300 basis points. We destroyed Orange County. We destroyed Mexico. We destroyed the agency mortgage market. And by the middle of 95, the Fed had not only paused, but had started cutting because it realized it went too far. That was just 300 basis points. So don't underestimate the long and variable lags with 250 basis points plus what will probably be about a trillion dollars of QT. It's going to happen this year because those lags are about to really kick in. Okay, so David, take us forward 12 months and give us the probability of these three scenarios. Scenario one, policy mistake, the Fed over tightens. Scenario two, policy mistake, the Fed under tightens, and markets get carried away again. Scenario three, the Fed gets it just right. Give us each of these probabilities, and I'm going to ask the two of you to do the same. It's a great question. I actually am kind of a believer in the soft landing 95 scenario, that if they, they've got a pretty good chance, better than 50%, let's say 60%, they get this right. They pause. Things are okay. We've got some great positive supply side drivers and deregulation and corporate tax reform that are going to keep economic activity okay against the demand side backdrop of a tightening, negative demand side backdrop. That's my baseline scenario. I, I, I think the odds that they over tighten and do something a little, bit, uh, a, a little bit silly, sort of what the communications indicated last year, is very low. I would say 10%. The rest of the probability, 30% is they kind of give us an ease or, or an end of QT and give us that ratchet up that maybe creates the next leg of the cycle, which could be bubbly like the late 90s. Marcus would love that. Uh, I, OK, what I'll about you, Stephanie? Do. Well, I guess I'm, I'm going to be the pessimist on the panel then. I'm going to say the risks of over tightening are the highest in my estimation. So um, at least 40%, I would say, uh, risk of over tightening. Maybe 20% the risk of getting it just right, and the rest is under tightening. Chris? So uh, I think we saw earlier this year and uh, late last year what happens when people lose confidence in the Fed. Um, we had we, sentiment was broken, and we were going to a sentiment recession. If the Fed continues to hike and, and over tightens, I think we go back to that. I think it, it becomes a very difficult type of situation because. Again, go back and look at Greenspan, look at Bernanke. Yellen kind of skipped over this, but those feds had a crisis and a crisis to deal with. If they over tighten, I think we have a bit of a problem. The good thing is the bank situation or bank's balance sheets are in much better shape than they typically are. Can they do a soft landing? I, I suppose so, but I, I'm not a real positive guy, so typically it's very difficult, Oops, excuse me, 
to do a soft landing. And if they under tighten, you're right. It's, it's off to the races. Everything, everyone's happy, everything's great for the short term, but longer term, we'll have to pay the bill. Okay, so when we go back to the green room, I'm going to make you guys trade, and my bid off the spread is going to be huge. Okay, um, okay so let, let, let's zoom back a little bit. The economy. It's amazing to me how the view has evolved. Go to Davos 12 months ago. It was all about a synchronized pickup. Everything, almost every economy was accelerating. It's going to feed back onto itself. Things are fine. 12 months later, it's about a synchronized slowdown. Okay, in between, we had this notion of divergent growth. Yes, Europe, China can slow down, but the U.S. can do so much better. How can experts in a 12-month period change their mind so many times and so radically? Okay, what is it about the global economy that we don't understand anymore? Stephanie? Well, I'm not sure it's about the global economy. I think it's about, in large part, deliberate policy moves. I mean, it's everything from the tariffs to, you know, uncertainty about whether the tax cuts are producing the intended effects and so forth. So I feel like the, the swing has more to do with recalibrating expectations about growth, especially here in the U.S., based on changing policy moves more than almost anything else. Okay, of the three scenarios for this year, global pickup, global slowdown, or divergent growth with the U.S. doing okay and the rest of the world slowing? Which one would you pick? I'm divergent growth. I okay. think the U.S. David? is going to do all right. I, I'm divergent growth as well. I think um, we're going to slow in the U.S. We're not going to have 2017, 2018 growth. That monetary policy pipeline is going to start to gush instead of trickle with those long and variable lags, and that's going to offset some of the good stuff that we got the last couple of years on the supply side. So. Where I worry is how that monetary policy feedback through the dollar works in emerging markets, works in particular in China, and works in the global debt markets where everybody is a dollar funder. And they've got a large increase in cost of funds coming, and it's not clear that their business models are going to work as well. So I think that storyline, which, by the way, is a very late 1990s style storyline, Mohammed. It was very much the guys who borrowed in the early 90s that had to deal with the higher rates from the 94 hikes that blew up in the late 90s. Uh, commodities rolled over, EM rolled over, and um, I, I think we're going to have to watch this very carefully. I know there's a lot of EM bullishness out there because the Fed's pausing, the dollar's supposed to come off, which it really hasn't. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in that camp. I'm a little more nervous on the EM and the commodities. How about you, David? Um, so, one, I don't usually get invited to Davos, and, and what I would say about that... I don't that, go either, so, <laughs> but I read. <laughs> and so our, our view on the globe, globe is this, and U.S., we are diverging. But what we've been seeing, what we would expect to see is the U.S. is slowing down. Uh, the situation in China is getting worse, as we can see. There's a lot of demand pull ahead uh, late last year, and we think we're starting to see the issue there. We're still wrangling with trade policy and so on and so forth. So by the end of the year, we think the U.S. starts to slow down, but we think the, the globe starts to stabilize. Because one of the things that you are starting to see is rates across the globe are starting to come down, and we've seen that reaction function. It's actually a pretty good reaction function, whether it's houses in, in the U.S. or whether it's funding overseas. David, if I was sitting in this room, I would have gotten all excited by your initial statement about the Fed. And I would have thought, OK, emerging markets is where I want to take my off benchmark bet right. because they do best when global liquidity is fine. But then you told me, be careful, because the legacy issues are going are, are to come back and haunt yes. a few of them. Are you making a judgment about the asset class as a whole, or are you saying just be careful how you express your view in the more risky asset classes? I think we're just looking at over indebtedness and what that might mean in a world where rates and spreads are higher than they were during the QE era. So the, the folks who gorged at the trough of zero interest rates in QE, those balance sheets that could lever in 2010, 11, 12, 13, non-financial corporates and emerging markets are the ones that are now in a, a, a difficult position. 
If you look at financials or households, they were the problem last time. They already delevered. They don't have to worry so much about this higher rate, higher spread QT world. And, and I think that's where I look for signs of stress. And we've already seen it a little bit in the non-financial corporate space. We've certainly seen it in EM. I, I, I just caution that just because the Fed is pausing and might be a backstop to a slowdown, like it was in the mid-90s, there's still a lot of legacy debt that got taken out over the last 10 years that may be funding businesses and countries that are not in a position to pay it back at these levels. Stephanie, David, despite how trendy he looks, <laughs> gave us an old view, old world view of the world on debt. Okay, a lot of what's being written today says we overestimate the debt issue, that the economy has fundamentally changed, that there's actually more debt capacity than in the old days. And that's certainly true for the US and, and other advanced economy, and perhaps it's even true for the emerging world. After all, interest rates are going to re remain low for a very long time. You're writing a book on this. You told me in the middle of it. Where are you on this view? Is it, is it the old school view, notwithstanding the trendy clothes? Okay, or is it the new view that we just over, we over stress and over worry about debt? Well, I think I mostly, I'm agree, I agree with what your concerns are with respect to the ability of many leveraged uh, corporations and countries uh, to be able in an atmosphere of even modestly increasing interest rates to get caught out and to have difficulty paying it back. But my focus in the work that I've done is kind of making a point of recognizing when countries borrow in a currency other than their own, that the risks are completely different and concerns about debt and debt service uh, are, are very important and very legitimate. Whereas if you've got a country like Japan or the US or uh, the UK or what, you know, you, you don't have the same level of concern because you know, the debt is all denominated in a currency that you and only you can issue at the end of the day and the risks are just fundamentally different. So yeah, I think that the national conversation around debt has been, um, has misunderstood this and underappreciated the importance of being the sovereign currency issuer. And so for many years in the US, we heard warnings about how the US was going to turn into Greece if we didn't get our fiscal house in order and those sorts of things. And I think there has been a, a big rethink on that. And you are starting to see people say, all right, hang on. You know, Ray Dalio does this in his latest book where you know, he's, the, the words come screaming off the page because he puts them in boldface type. When a country controls its own currency, it's very different than countries that borrow in a currency they don't control. And it appears on almost every page. I mean, he really is trying to help us get um, a better sort of um, understanding of when debt becomes a real risk. So, so people said that about the UK when the UK dominated the world, right? And, all it, and, and it turns out that at some point, that's no longer true. What's no longer true? That even when you issue your own mm -hmm. currency, even when you're the global currency, even when um, you borrow in your own currency, at some point, people step back, okay? Well, okay, so in the case of Japan, I think Japan's instructive here, and you know a lot about Japan, so you can disagree or um, help me out if you feel so inclined, but we were talking backstage. You know, I think the Bank of Japan has done a really good job showing us just what can happen in the event that markets want to pull back and the appetite isn't there for government securities, even for a currency issuer, the central bank can step in, make a market, and buy up as much as necessary. And we were just talking backstage that Japan's got close to half of all the outstanding, uh, of all the JGBs, and there's nothing to prevent them from going to 70 or 80 or higher. So, so what you say is really consequential because one of the concerns that market have had is that we no longer have a spare tire, that we've used up monetary policy. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are, yes, they've gone up, but they're still relatively low. The balance sheet is still relatively large, and we're running relatively big deficits. So if we somehow stumble into a recession, there simply isn't the fi firepower on policy, and you're telling us actually, no, wait, yeah. there is. Don't worry about it. 
Yeah, that's my view. I mean, I've written about this a lot. I've written about this for Bloomberg. I, I don't subscribe to the view that monetary policy is essentially out of ammo, that there's not much room uh, to cut rates, and therefore there's not much that monetary policy is going to be able to do in the face of a slowdown. And fiscal policy, likewise, is completely out of bullets because we've got trillion-dollar deficits projected for the, fourth, you know, for the next year, couple of years, or whatever. Um, there's nothing to prevent a future Congress from passing a, a stimulus, cutting taxes, increasing spending, some combination like they did before. There's absolutely nothing to prevent a future Congress from doing that. So the, the tension is on the political side. It's not on the economics. Okay, so Chris, we hear the U.S. can outpace the rest of the world. We, we need not get contaminated by what's happening elsewhere. We hear that the likelihood is that we have much more policy flexibility than what has been priced in so far, which leaves a third issue that was of concern a few months ago, but is less so politics, oh. right? Self-inflicted wounds Correct. from the shutdown to questions about the independence of the Fed. Right. Stephanie, you mentioned trade. So in the old days, we used to say, politics are over here, markets are protected by the Fed, Let's not worry about politics. Then last year, that shifted a little bit. Yep. W what about this year? So uh, the Fed has gone out and said, we're independent, independent, independent. And, and I take that as if you have a boss and says, my door's always open, it's open, it's open, there, there's an issue there. Right? <laughs> and the, the other thing you have, and the optics look horrific, and I don't think they, they did this, but if you look from December to the beginning of January, there's one thing that happened. Trump threatened to fire Powell. Right? And then all of a sudden, there was a come to Jesus moment and a turn. Optics look terrible. That doesn't give you independent, that doesn't support your independent view. The other thing is, as you, as you look at this slowdown, what has Trump wanted to do? He's wanted to stop the Fed. He's wanted to stop rates to go higher. And to a certain degree, you look at it and it's, this slowdown and this shutdown has given the Fed less information, less data to work with. And so as a consequence, it's boxed them in to a certain degree. I worry that, that you're right, that, that we are merging too much politics in the markets, and, and this is a problem going forward. And, and, and I'm not really sure how to discount it at this point in time. So, so a big problem or just a, an irritation? It, it's an irritation at this point in time, but if it's not addressed, it can become a festering and bigger problem. And again, the Fed, if you look at Powell, he's well-educated, he's very bright, he's articulate, but for some reason, he. He keeps muddling the message. The market keeps stumbling on these things. Maybe he's saying too much. I don't know. But the Fed can't have independence issues, and they're dealing with the balance sheet and Fed funds, and now there's talk about a global slowdown. They need to, to shrink the scope of what they're doing, and bringing politics into the picture is, is not helping at all. Okay, David, before we go to questions, um, let's spend a couple of minutes on asset allocation issues and portfolio construction. Um, earlier this morning, Ron showed what I thought were two very powerful set of charts. The first spoke to the people in this room that they've basically outperformed their peers. And congratulations for that, and it's great to be among you. The second one was that risk mitigation instruments failed last year. That if you look at how he showed U.S. government bonds and gold, and basically, there was nowhere to go to. There was no place to hide, mm -hmm. right? What we got is the inverse of 2017, where everything worked for you. High, high returns, no volatility, and correlations failed, but you made money on every single asset class. Last year, we started having lower returns, higher volatility, and correlations that actually hurt you and don't provide any risk mitigation. What do you see for this year? So I think the the storyline that drove that was higher inflation expectations coming in, mainly in the February sell-off, uh, and the idea that the Fed was going to have to raise rates, possibly beyond neutral. Jay then corroborated that view in October, after even after the inflation data had rolled over in the summer. And so you had a, a group of, of, you know, I call them inflationistas. They've been around for a while, and they, and, and, and they got very excited once again. And the one uh, poison to a risk parity trade or a risk mitigation trade of a long 
equities, leveraged long fixed income portfolio, which has been uh, a godsend for most people over the last 10 years, is significant amounts of inflation and a loss of Fed credibility because you're really betting on the Fed as a backstop of sorts. So we saw that play out. And, and Mohammed, it really just comes down to your view on longer term inflation risks in the system. Um, and you know, for me, uh, I've banged the drum pretty hard with our clients that disinflation risks are just far larger in this economy than inflation risks. If you look at the last seven years, the average miss for the PCE inflation rate is 70 basis points. That's a cumulative 5% miss. As the economy has traveled past full employment, there's no Phillips curve. It's dead. Let's just throw it away and talk about the other drivers of inflation. Ooh. So I, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people about the secular forces of technology, demographics, the cyclical forces of monetary policy, tightening, very disinflationary, corporate tax reform and deregulation, very disinflationary, and just the levels of debt as well, which are also disinflationary. As long as you come back to that view, you're, you're not going to find yourself in a position of last year where the inflationistas get the upper hand and both stocks and bonds go down at the same time because the Fed's going to have to jack rates to maintain credibility and kind of drive the economy down in a Volcker-esque way. I, I'm a firm believer that that scenario is one of the least likely scenarios. Uh, I wrote a lot about it all last year, trying to you know, bang the drum, and we had some tough, tough months for sure. But I mean, this year's been a great start for those trades. Uh, they're all up nicely. And, uh, and I think that's probably so how I view it for the next long the 10 year here at 274. I mean, I, I tend to look at the leverage long more in the front end of the curve, okay. uh, especially now with two year notes not very far from 10 year notes. Uh, the next cyclical downturn will be a steepener, as all cyclical downturns are. And if I leverage up that front end, I've got I've got a, a two year note which could go back to nearly zero or you know, if, if some people have their way, uh, like the European style, maybe even negative in the next iteration of unconventional monetary policies. I've got a lot of protection in dollars per basis point in that front end, whether it's euro dollar futures, two years. I don't need to play so much with the long end because the long end will get dragged into this very long term inflation debate, which could be different than the short term inflation debate. Stephanie, so growth is fine. Policy, fine. Debt, not an issue. Inflation, not an issue. That's, that's what I've heard. And the great thing about being a moderator is you don't have to express your views. So this is one. <laughs> is it really that good? No, I mean, I, I think, look, I think that uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic on growth than I think a lot of people are. So at give this us point. a number for this year. So for the year, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised like two two five two seven seems reasonable uh to me i'm still waiting you know to see to feel the full effects of what we did with respect to the tax code i mean we haven't actually had anybody file yet under the new tax laws and so all of this stuff about sugar high and so forth i, I feel like that's overstated i i'm waiting to fully appreciate uh the effects and so um on inflation, I think my, my concern is that the Fed misreads it and that I agree with you that the, the, the likelihood is that it's a disinflationary environment. But I'm not confident that the Fed will read it that way. And so I worry about these preemptive efforts to get ahead of the curve and so forth. So um, things are pretty good, I, I think. OK, so last question before we open it up for your questions. Um, Chris, some people would say what we've heard so far means that there won't be a major shift from passive to active management because the neighborhood will get friendly again. Right. Okay. It's not clear you really want to take lots of risk in illiquid asset classes right. because liquid asset classes will do fine again and that last year was an aberration. Mm -hmm. Is that the message to take away from, from, from what we've heard so far? Um, 
I don't think so. So what I think, bigger picture, what's happening with active and passive, we're trying to find that equilibrium level, how much passive, how much active. And we're getting closer to that 50% level, which I think is important. With regard to last year, there was a couple things that, that did occur. You, you did have correlations. So what, what happened, or what we saw happen in the equity market is everyone was crowded into a very similar trade. It was all growth momentum. And, and I would point out that if you look at some of the low volatility funds and, and minimum variance funds, they actually did quite well last year, giving you flat or positive returns. But because everyone was crowded into those trades, it was similar to 2007, where you had one blow up causing a cascade effect. We've washed a lot of that out of the system. And what we're seeing, what we've been saying for the last two years is we want to be up in quality and down in risk. We've been telling clients that there's not enough value in value, that, that value has basically been a proxy for risk, which hurt a lot of quant managers last year. Now what we're saying is after two years of underperformance and a significant sell-off at the end of last year, there is real value in value. And what you want to do is now you can put on idiosyncratic risk. Now is the time for active managers. Because what you want to do, at least at the margin, you want to find those value opportunities. You want to find the situations where sentiment is horrific. You want to find those situations where guidance is being brought down and the stocks are reacting. We think that's where you can make money. And that's very difficult to do in, in a, an ETF or a passive fund. We think there's a lot more opportunity from the idiosyncratic uh, part of the marketplace. And, and we think active management will we expect them to have a very good year, and that's what we're beginning to see in the first couple of weeks of this year. Okay, let me come to you. If you're all not in a great mood after this, <laughs> um, if we can put the lights up and, and, and take questions. So there's one over here. The mics will come 